Hi, everyone. It's Jason Birak of Wall Street from Main Street, and welcome to a Wall Street from Main Street interview. Today, John Manfred and I are joined by a special guest. We're joined by Keith Schaefer of the Oil and Gas Investments Bulletin. Uh, Keith, how are you doing today? I'm doing great today. Thank you. Yeah, Keith, I was actually wondering, your most recent article, you talked about these uh, new dividend energy trusts and uh, why uh, these energy trusts are making a comeback. Can you explain that to our audience, what's been happening? Sure. Well, I, I, on both sides of the border, you know, millions of Canadians and millions of Americans both bought the energy income trusts all through the 2000s, all through last decade. And they were hugely popular so and, and very successful investments. So they paid out uh, a dividend that was both uh, a, a real dividend and a what they called a return of capital. And, and, and so that's, this increased the yield on these products. So during a time of low interest rates, investors now had a very easy to understand investment product that paid them anywhere from, you know, 8 to 14% a year, and you really couldn't find that anywhere else. It was so successful that the Canadian government banned them uh, in late 06, and everybody had until just this past January to convert back to a regular corporation. So what's happened now is that the oil patch investment bankers and the management teams have figured out a way to get around this ban by the Canadian government. And that is to use American assets. Well, basically, they mean any foreign assets. But the two Canadian trusts that have started up here recently are both using U.S. assets because this product appeals to a very conservative crowd who wants high income and very safe income. And, of course, if you want to leave Canada, the best place to have that security is the United States. So we've seen two new companies in the last six months pop up and as these new trusts that are each paying, well, when they started, they were paying about 10 or 11 percent, uh, maybe not quite that much, 9 to 10 percent. And now they've, the, the, the prices have been bid up that they are only paying about 7 or 8 percent. So what's happening is that investors are getting like a 10 to 15 percent jump in capital gains right away after the IPO of these companies. And then they're getting a steady like 8 percent dividend, which, you know, for them, because they bought the IPO, it's more like 9 10%. But in any event, it has been a, a great success, and there's a lot more guys who are going to start to do this. I see this as being one of the next big, big things in oil and gas, and I'm going to be writing about them for my subscribers in the newsletter. Oh, that's good. Uh, so you think these would be a good alternative for people who want a uh, fixed income? Absolutely yield, and, and particularly for the Americans, it's great because right now, if they want to buy yield in the energy patch, they can buy these master limited partnerships or MLPs that are mostly pipeline companies, not so much the producers. So they also get, when, when they're buying these Canadian trusts, they're getting their dividends in Canadian dollars. And if you believe, as I do, that the U.S. dollar will continue to go lower, the U.S. government wants the greenback as low as possible, as quick as possible, as long as it doesn't cause any economic collapse like we saw in 2008. So if you believe that, then all of a sudden you're getting a high yield, plus you're getting the currency move. So, you know, for Americans to get your dividends in Canadian dollars is just icing on the cake. And, and unlike the old Canadian trust, where you were only allowed to have I think it was 49 or 50% American ownership, there's no restriction on these companies as to how much Americans can own. So it's just a great, great investment vehicle for them. Keith, those are some great points. And, you know, you brought up the inflation argument here, and, you know, we're seeing that happen right now. A lot of companies are, a lot of American companies, multinational companies, their input costs are going through the roof. And, you know, if you're a bond investor, you know, you got to deal with that. You got to deal, you know, with uh, inflation risk, interest rates going up. So if you're in these um, master limited partnerships and the Canadian Income Trust they, um, or whatever they just changed it to now that you're talking about, I mean, it seems like you're avoiding a lot of that risk and you're still getting good yield. Great yield, low risk. You know, obviously, if commodity prices fall off pretty dramatically, then there is a great risk that these payouts could get, you know, decreased. 
But I would say of the two that I've seen so far and talking to the management teams in Calgary and how they're planning these things, they're going to move slowly. Towards the end of the, the, the big bull run last time in Energy Trust, you did see regularly people get paid out close to 100% or even more of cash flow. And these companies were so successful, the stocks were so successful, they could just raise money to fill that gap, issue more equity. But now we're, we're at the beginning of this new run, so everyone's being very conservative. They're saying only 50%, 60% payout ratio. They'll keep that other 40% of cash flow to grow the business and increase payouts down the road. So that's great. But certainly, in terms of safety, if the oil price went back to 65 or $70 a barrel, then there's no doubt that any oil-weighted trust would probably have to cut their dividend stream and uh that's you know the double edged sword you know of the leverage keith so you would say then that the leverage of these um oil and natural gas trusts they tend to track the oil and natural gas prices uh, pretty accurately or do you think they don't track them that accurately as compared to you know a regular oil and gas producer no i, I would say no they don't track it near as well as a regular producer just because they they'll 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 trade on yield and as one once the uh, they'll trade around 7 or 8% yield. So once the market kind of decides that the cash flow is stable and the assets providing the cash flow are stable, they're generally going to just um, price it at 7% yield unless there's such a great and sustained increase in commodity prices that obviously the, the bank, the, the cash is building up inside the company and there's the possibility for an increase in the dividend. But basically, no, they do not track the price of oil as well as the regular producers. Okay, now, Keith, um, I wanted to uh, discuss fracking with you, moving on to the next topic here. Now, can you briefly explain um, what fracking is and horizontal drilling and some of the other terms that some of our listeners might not understand uh, that much about? Sure. sure. Well, horizontal drilling is something that most investors can imagine in their mind, a picture where... You know, for years and years, wells went, obviously, straight down and just did, horizontal, just did vertical wells. Well, they've been able to, drew, to do, the industry has been able to do horizontal drilling now for almost 40 years, but really it was just in the last decade, maybe the last 15 years, where the industry has been able to combine it with another technology called hydraulic fracturing to really open up these new shale deposits. And so what hydraulic fracturing is, and everyone just calls it fracking for short, is they send water, and that's the hydraulic part, down the wellbore at ultra-high speeds, ultra-high pressure, with some sand, and that sand gets blown out with the water at really high pressure into the rock, into the shale, where the oil and gas is held, and then as that rock breaks up from all that pressure, it releases the oil and gas back into the well. And this is something that they perfected about 15 years ago in the Barnett Shale of Texas, and it has just spread like wildfire. It went off and through to the Midwest, up into Canada, and now it's start, starting to go international. And the reason that everyone's doing it is because, well, it's two reasons. One is that the economics on this is very good. You know, a, a horizontal well costs two to three times what a vertical well costs, but here's the kicker, they get four to seven times the amount of oil and gas back from the well. So your return on investment is so much higher, generally speaking, on these horizontal wells. So now everybody is chasing these new plays. And the other reason that everyone's got so excited about it is because all these shale plays, we know where they are. We've drilled through them all through the last 50 years like Swiss cheese as we have gone after deeper horizons, deeper de oil deposits. So you look at things like the Bakken, or in Alberta, you have uh, uh, the largest for oil formation in Canada is called the Cardium Formation. Well, it's been producing for 70 years now, but there's two zones. There's the one zone that everybody's produced from, and then there's this shale zone, or, or, or maybe it wasn't quite shale, maybe it was just a really tight sand, and they'd call those tight oil deposits. And, and the, where the molecules and, and, the, and, the, and the sands or the rock is packed in so tight that you, don't, you can't liberate the oil and gas with, with regular technology. But now with this new fracking, you send that water and that sand down the drill hole and it just whacks out 
all the rock and breaks it into like lots of little pieces. And so the beauty of it is now, Jason, is that we know where these deposits are. We've drilled through them. There's almost no geological risk. There's no location risk. We know where they are. We know everything about them. We've got the old core logs, so we can tell all what the oil's like, what the rock is like. And so there's no real mystery. It's just a land race. It's a land grab. So everybody is out, you know, staking land like crazy, trying to uh, get the biggest position possible. And so that's why everyone's doing it. That's why everybody's getting it out there, because it's fairly low risk. We know where they are. Uh, obviously, we're going to discover more, but, I mean, there's just so much low-hanging fruit now. There's a whole new class of low-hanging fruit of beautiful, thick, rich, profitable oil deposits and gas deposits that have just become unlocked. Hmm. That's very interesting. Um, one thing I read about... Uh about fracking is there some uh resistance towards it do you know any uh can you name some countries where there might be some geopolitical risk uh for fracking hey right right now guys it's everywhere the geopolitical risk is everywhere the biggest geopolitical risk for sure right now is france so france uh is in the midst of a lot of elections right now and they have a huge oil deposit just east of paris that runs maybe 100 miles by 100 miles and Whoa. Whoa. yeah, it's a big one. It's, it's, it's a very big deposit. So uh, a lot of U.S. companies have gone in there. Hess Corp, listed on the New York Stock Exchange, has gone in there. Uh, Toreador Resources, a junior, has gone in there. In Canada, uh, a company called Realm Energy is in there. Uh, in the in the U.K., there's a company called Sterling Resources that's in there. So there's lots of companies that have gone into the Paris Shale Basin, and uh, what's happened here is that they were just about to start drilling all these wells when the politicians said, hey, we need to look at that. There was some environmental uh, hue and cry, and, and basically uh, they have now put a ban on fracking countrywide until they can study it a little bit more. So that that was tens of millions of dollars in exploration that has now been stopped on a dime. But you're seeing this in the States too, you know, Pennsylvania has stopped leasing new land for fracking. New York State has not yet allowed fracking in the, in the huge Marcellus Shale. And that's one monstrous, beautiful gas deposit that is just, you know, right close to major markets. So, but, you know, the environmental movement has said, and to a certain degree, rightly so, you know what, we need to, uh, we need to check into this because what we're seeing is that there are instances of water pollution in areas where the fracking is. And the industry says, well, that's not us. And everybody else says, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but let's just study this a little bit more because it's still a pretty new thing. Like I said earlier in our conversation, it's only really been going since the late 1990s, you know, 12, 15 years. It started off in Texas. And, you know, even Texas is starting to look at the environmental issues, not so much for the quality of water, but the quantity of water. Because these things use huge, numerous tanker trucks of water. And what you've had in Texas is, is that local residents have seen their wells go dry at the same time that they're watching all these water trucks drive by their street on the way to the wells. How, imagine how they feel about that. So, you know, when Texas is having an environmental issue, that everyone's going to have a look at it. That's some very good points, Keith. And you know, Texas is also having drought problems too. So, you know, those, those, uh, the rainwater is not being replaced, you know, by normal rains here as a uh, part of, you know, their wheat crop is in jeopardy and they've experienced, you know, record warm temperatures. So I want, I want to, uh, move on a little bit about, you mentioned geopolitical risk. And I think that's, you know, very important as an oil and gas investor. I've, uh, you know, been a subscriber to your, uh, free newsletter for, over a year now, and you know, I enjoy reading and listening to your past interviews on uh, other people's places. And you know, you talk about like Thai Thailand um, oil and gas companies, and you talk about Canadian ones, and you know, ones in South America. I was wondering how you, though, like, you know, go through the basic research stuff and figure out like geopolitical risk for a certain area, and what you know, whether or not it's worth you know risk reward ratio. Uh, with a dealing with a national oil company or companies uh, or a country's politicians. Well, I, I think that for the most part, 
different countries are fairly well known for what their politics are, so you, you know what you're getting into fairly quickly, though I would say certainly Europe is a bit of a change where you, you know, it's a little more to the left of center than North America, and a lot of companies have started to spend a lot of money in there, and so, and now they've really kind of put the brakes on this whole development issue on some of these shale deposits. So that was probably a little bit of a surprise to people. But for the most part, uh, I, I, I think that what you see is what you get. Nobody's going to go down into some of the leftist uh, Latin American countries and start drilling for these things because they're well known at being kind of uh, anti-resource development. And uh, so so I don't think that you're going to see any surprises in your geopolitical. You, you're generally going to want to stick with uh, you know, your first world countries. So like I say, I, I guess in one sense, Jason, that brings up an interesting point. You're going to see the first world countries start to get a lot more uh, politically and socially motivated around fracking. You're seeing that. When New York State is, is basically making a statement and making a stand saying, hey, we need to have this study, I think you're going to see a lot of the other first world countries, uh, like you would traditionally assume that Anglo-Saxon countries would be the best place where rule of law is respected, they know how to do business, but, you know, you're starting to see that in some of these places, that's not happening. You're starting to see that the, the whole fracking issue could cause really the entire global industry to just have a two- or three-year pause in the development of all these new juicy resources just so they can get their environmental ducks in a row and make sure that everybody's doing things by the book and that these, are, these things are properly being monitored. Those are some good points, Keith. And you know this the the whole fracking thing, like it, you know, it fits in with with peak oil. Like a lot of the you know light sweet crude, a lot of that stuff is gone. You know, and they're moving on to the next you know low hanging fruit with what you said. And you know these these politicians here, like you know they're they're wanting to push their renewable projects here. So everyone's competing for pretty much the same pool of capital, more or less. Um, I don't see, you know, humongous amount of capital growth, although, you know, we never know if Ben Bernanke is going to come along with QE3 and just put, you know, trillions more into the system. Although, you know, if that was spent on, you know, energy projects, I think the world would be a lot better off if we, you know, put the money into energy infrastructure and, you know, making sure everyone gets, you know, cheap electricity so we don't have, you know, blackouts in uh, China where they don't have their electricity to grow. Yep, that, that, that could be very true, my friend. That could be very true. Hey, I was actually wondering, I wanted to get back to one of the, uh, the France ban you talked about. I was wondering, do you think this ban is going to uh, last, or do you think they're going to just study it and then let it, let it go <laughs> later? My, my personal guess, well, in, in, in France they do things a little bit differently, but uh, I would guess this is just round one. You know, they, they, this was a year of a lot of elections, a lot of politicians looking to impress the public. So, but it, it's not just the big Paris Basin that is getting attention. The French national company Total, which I know is public, but uh, is still very connected with the French government, they have some big shale gas deposits down in the south that they would like to do. So it's, uh, I really do believe this is just round one. We're going to, this is not the end of fracking in France. And I, I think you're just going to see uh, as the discussion develops, saner heads prevail, really tight regulations get put into place, but I, I absolutely do see the fracking process being allowed to proceed in France after enough time has gone by when all the politicians can beat their chests and say, I stood up for the people. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to belittle them by any means. I, I, I think that the, the oil and gas industry has had their way for a very long time in places like Alberta. And despite all the environmental uh, stringent things that they follow, uh, you know, it's always good to have another group of people with a different set of background and eyes look at these types of issues and say, well, is this really the way it should be done? So I, I, I'm not uh, unhappy that we're seeing this attention. I, I just think it could truly cause a two or three year, you know, delay in the global rollout of fracking in a big, big way. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Keith. I've seen the two documentaries, uh, Gasland. I think everyone's seen that one. But there's also a grassroots documentary called uh, All Fracked Up that uh, most other experts, you know, I've talked to about uh, oil and gas have not have not seen yet. Uh, I think that one's very good too. So, 
you know, I think what a lot of the environmentalists are most upset about, Keith, is the fact that, you know, here in the U.S., is that the oil and gas companies, you know, as part of the EPA, the Clean Water Act, you know, they got an exemption into it, you know, without, you know, letting the EPA, you know, do the workup, like you said. So I, I think, you know, once that stuff is worked through, I don't know how long it's going to take, like, you know, maybe two or three years, but, you know, if, if they can, if the oil and gas companies can prove that, hey, you know, we can extract the, uh, the stuff with fracking and, you know, we can clean up the water, then, um, you know, it'll be allowed as, you know, as long as they can prove that they can clean up the water. So there might be some contrarian investing opportunities down the line, you know, with a water pure play company that could perhaps clean up the water. Jason, I, I think you're so right. I, I'm, I'm really surprised that the fracking guys got that exemption. There's no reason for it. And, the, you know, the industry has done almost everything in its power to shoot itself in the foot on the PR front on this issue. So, Look, guys, just say what's in your fracking fluids because usually it's not the ingredients that are the proprietary part. It's how they're mixed together. And so if everybody has to say, here's what's in our soup and here in our fracking soup and here's how much of, of this chemical and that chemical, because the reality is that there's less than 1% chemicals in almost all these fracks. So, you know, but but now the the people don't trust the industry because of all this, and so on the PR front they're behind the eight ball to start, and uh, that, that's why I agree with you, Jason. I think water treatment, the next big thing in oil and gas besides energy trusts, is water, and, and you are going to see a huge amount of new technologies and startups and uh, people say, hey, we can we can you know either recycle this water or you know, return it to, to potable status uh, as cheap as, as, as they can. And because now what happens is most of the water is left down in the formation, and the stuff that's come up is just put on a landfill. And uh, it's some of the bad stuff is taken out, but a, a lot of cases it's not very much. So that's why I think that you're right. You find a company that can get a cheap water treatment or recycling process for fracking water, that's going to be the next big stock to own. Uh, I agree. That's a very uh, good observation about the PR. Like, I've been reading some things that said, I thought it was very interesting you said it's how it's mixed, it's not the chemicals. And they said, uh, some of the things I've read, they said they have 29 or 30 different uh, chemical uh, deadly oxides. And if they just did a better PR job, you know, you wouldn't see articles... Uh, popping up like this so i thought that well, was and, good and, and good pr doesn't mean putting a spin on things it means being honest with people and being straightforward and you know treating people with respect and getting the right information out there it, 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 it's not a negative nefarious thing to say it just means you know doing the right thing it's, so uh that, that's what i think is is needed here these, these guys need to be a lot more proactive because sometimes you get the impression that, you know, someone comes up to the oil and gas industry and says, hey, you're not doing that right. And the industry looks at them and stares at them for a second and says, yeah, but you're stupid. <laughs> like, no, guys, you, can't, you, you, you can't say that. You got to you gotta do the right thing and you got to disclose what's in these uh, these fracking soups. And, and it's unfortunate the EPA and up here in Canada uh, – has had to like basically subpoena companies to get them to do that. They they are not doing it voluntarily. That's a great point, Keith. And you know, one thing I see about you and your work, you know, the articles and the interviews you've done that you do a great job of is you take those, you know, complicated technical terms and you know, in the oil and gas industry there's a lot of them and you take those complicated technical terms and you know, you explain it and easy to understand stuff so people like me and John can understand it. You know, John's been investing in oil and gas stocks for 10 years now and you know, he's he just, him and I both agree that you know, you're probably the best at at taking something, you know, really complicated and explaining it, you know, so you know, people like us can understand it. Yeah, well, I've God bless you guys. Yeah, I've been a subscriber for about three or four years to your uh, free newsletter. So I think it's a great, for, great uh, newsletter. And I was actually wondering, uh, the industry, the oil uh, 
the best way to play the oil that I, from what I read from your articles, is the energy services, and you say it's also the safest way. Can you explain why it's going to be the why it's the most profitable or safest way? Well, I say it's one of the safest way because of this huge new trend towards the horizontal drilling and fracking. The industry just can't build enough equipment fast enough to satisfy the demands of the producers to drill baby drill. So these guys are raising money as fast as they can and getting these fracking machines and new drills uh, that can go horizontal all built. And so they have an unbelievable backlog. So in the face of a pretty uncertain global economic recovery, like anybody who says, oh, yeah, we're out of the woods and things are going to be great, or, oh, my God, we're heading into the toilet tomorrow, nobody really knows. There's so much conflicting information out there. It's very tough to decide, is oil going to be 110 bucks or is it going to be 80 bucks six months from now? And so obviously that's going to have a big impact on producers, on the stocks of these producing oil companies, depending on who's right on that equation. But for the energy services stocks, it doesn't matter. Even with oil at 80 bucks, the backlog of sales these guys have is unbelievable. It's years. And so they're, they're, over the next 18 months, I don't see any slowdown at all. And so all these guys have huge sales backlogs. One of the brokerage firms out of Calgary that's just a little oil and gas boutique brokerage firm, it's called Peters & Company, they estimated that every single company in their coverage universe – for energy services stocks will increase their cash flow per share this year by 40%. Every single company up 40%. That is a remarkable number. That's fantastic, Keith. And you know that that's going to lead you know down the line to you know tremendous profits. You know pretty much pretty much as long as oil price stays in a relative sweet spot. And you know you mentioned the the volatility of the oil price here, but one thing that's not volatile, Keith is the fact that you know world population we're already over 7 billion right now and then you have subsidized oil prices in China and and um Saudi Arabia where you know some of the consumers well all the consumers are paying in China you know under a dollar a gallon gasoline no matter what and in Saudi Arabia it's what under 30 cents a gallon gasoline no matter what and you know these guys aren't changing their consuming habits like here in the US or up there in Canada where you are when you know gas prices go higher so you know the the demand side of the equation is not really fluctuating that much, you know, because oil is being subsidized. So I, these guys need to drill, baby, drill, like you said. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting few years here because demand definitely is picking up slowly but surely, and supply uh, supply is getting a bit tougher because what's happening is you're having this resource nationalism where the where the Outside of the first world, you're, you're seeing all the second and third world countries get their national oil companies a lot more involved in developing their assets, and by definition, they are just not as efficient or competent as the private sector. And they're also starting to move off, like the Chinese and the Koreans, into other areas. They're going up and buying assets, competing against private industry, a very unfair situation, uh, and paying top dollar for assets all over the world. Now, it's Sometimes they develop them themselves, but most of the time they have joint venture partners. But anything that what, what it means is that big companies like China or Russia or Kazakhstan that are big oil producers, you've got to share with the state. So it, it means that the profits aren't quite as big as they are in other places. So those assets in those countries don't get developed as much. So supply is a real concern because uh, everybody, all these other countries, they want to keep it for themselves. Hmm. That's real. That's a good point. Um, I was wondering. Uh, you uh, recently sent out a newsletter about uh, valuing oil companies. I was wondering, what's the number one thing you look for when you value an oil company? Well, I, I think the two things you look for right away is how much oil is the company producing, oil or gas is the company producing right now, and B how big is the land position that they have, what, what we'd call the undeveloped land position. So if they've got 100,000 acres in the middle of or very near to a big play, then that's what I want to know. I want to find out, okay, so if you've got this big land position, how close is it to some other producing wells? 
because while that's always been important, it's even more important now because these new shale deposits are actually quite consistent over very large areas. So before, a company would tap into a pool of oil and there'd be no guarantee that there was another pool of oil a few miles away, even though there might be a hill there that would intimate that there could be. But with these new shale plays, these shale plays go for miles and miles and miles. So if you're just beside another asset that's producing from a shale deposit, there's a very, very good chance that that deposit is on your ground and the market can truly look at your neighbor's production and guesstimate pretty close what kind of production you're going to have. And so that's why now these land plays are getting huge valuations, whereas before they really weren't getting anywhere close to what they are now. So that's, that, that's the most important thing when you're looking at these valuations because what happens is that a company who buys another company, they look at that undeveloped land position and they say, okay, judging by all the neighbors, we think that we could put this many wells down that will produce about this much oil, and they're going to be pretty close. That, that number is now much more real than it ever was in the past. So because these formations now are so geologically consistent over a large area, so you can put together a pretty close and reasonable valuation on these plays that really that didn't exist before. Now, Keith, um, I'm sure our listeners, by this point, after you've teased them a little bit, I, I'm sure they would love for you to list a few companies uh, for them to do some research on, maybe some juniors that are in the shale uh, spaces like what you're talking about and maybe some of the offshore companies, because I know you, you're big on a few companies you know in Asia. Well, what, what, I, I'd say there's a few new shale deposits that are about to be tested that, that are absolutely huge. They have the potential to be unbelievably large and create huge shareholder wealth if they work. And probably at the top of my list right now is a company called Tag Oil. So that symbol is TAO on the venture board or TAOIF on the bulletin board in the States. And they're developing a big shale play in New Zealand that they're going to drill late this year. Now that team has actually done very well because they've discovered a lot more oil in one of their other plays where they're going to go from probably 500 to 4,000 barrels this year even if that other shale play doesn't work. So I, I like that because there's, there's what I'd call a whoops property or a, or a second asset there that is developing cash flow without the big risky drill punt into the shale. And the other one is actually quite nearby. It's, it's, it's a big Australian shale, and the company's name is Petro Frontier. The symbol is PFC on the Toronto Stock Exchange. I'm sorry, I don't know what the, the U.S. symbol is. But again, they have, just like the New Zealand play, they own millions of acres in highly prospective shale. So we know the shale is there. It's been drilled through before. We know what the characteristics of the shale are like. And it's very similar. Both deposits are very similar to what the North American Bakken formation is like. And so investors have got very excited about these plays because these are small cap companies with big shale plays. They're very well funded. And they've got competent management teams. They've got teams that have found these types of deposits before. So they've, they're a really good punt. Now, I would caution investors, there's still a drill punt. And if they miss, both those stocks will get slaughtered. They'll be cut in half. But uh, I would suggest that the premium that these stocks are trading at now is telling us that the market believes their chances are very good. And um, what? And I guess. Oh, and sorry. Well, I was going to say the one we talked about water companies, and the the one water company I would tell everyone to go have a look at is a company called Secure Energy Services, and the symbol is S E S on the Toronto Stock Exchange. They clean up fracking water. They clean up oil. They they do all the very unsexy garbage kind of work that needs to get done in the oil and gas industry. So they'll store your oil, they'll sell your oil, they'll uh, clean up your oil, they'll clean up your water, they'll clean up your fracking fluids. They do it all. And they have great margins. They have great profit margins. The stock trades around 8 bucks 
and I just think that is going that company is going to be a huge cash cow over the next five years. And that company is already uh, profitable and has a dividend, uh, Keith. No dividend, uh, but it's profitable. Yes. Okay. Oh, all right. Those are sounds like some pretty good picks. Okay. Well, to thank uh, to wrap things up here, Keith, uh, just want to thank you very much for your time. Um, know you're a busy guy, and uh, you know we look forward to uh, having you back on here. And uh, can you tell our listeners uh, where people can find your work? Yes, uh, I have a very large library of very interesting stories that they can read for free at my website, almost 200 of them now, going back almost three years, at www.oilandgas-investments.com. So that's plural on investments and a hyphen between after the word gas. And so my picture is on the top of the masthead. They get to see what I look like. So there's a lot of uh, personal uh, effort that I put into the, the newsletter to make it uh, very readable and accessible to the common man. So they, you don't need to be a Ph.D. or a professional investor to understand the huge opportunity and revolution that's happening with all this shale stuff that's going on in oil and gas. Ah, that's great. I'm actually a subscriber to his uh, free newsletter, too, and I look at your website frequently, so I recommend it. So if you haven't checked it out, I would go check it out. And you talk about terms, you know, Keith, like the recycle ratio. Like I remember reading your article months ago about the recycle ratio. I'd never heard of it before, you know, as a way to value some of these oil companies. And it's just, you know, stuff that people on the in the industry and analysts know about, but, you know, the common man doesn't know about. And, you know, it's just another valuation tool for value investors like me, you know, to find good stocks. So I thank you very much. Absolutely. So thank you very much. for uh, Thank you, guys.